Osborne. I'm the Special Collections Librarian at NUI Galway, and I'm going to bring you back about 150 years here now, uh, move away from the digital for a little bit anyway. Uh, I'm going to talk to you, and this is really speaking to the unique and distinct collections. Uh, it's also talking about research and a number of other uh, themes that have come up in the workshops and the breakout sessions over yesterday and today. Uh, so I'm going to be talking to you about 19th century NAMA, and um, I'm sure everyone knows what NAMA is, I hope. Uh, I can't lay claim to use inventing the term 19th century NAMA. It was actually a researcher who came in and asked me what uh, the landed estate sale notices were about, and I explained them to her, and then she said to me, oh, they're like a 19th century NAMA, so that's where the title comes from. So just a very brief historical lesson. Uh, the, after the famine, many of the landed estates were bankrupt, uh, partly because of the famine and also partly because of, as you see there, uh, a lot of terms which have uh, become quite familiar to us in recent times, things like mortgaging, borrowing, conspicuous consumption and everything else. Um, and so they were obliged to sell some or all of their property. And uh, a special court was established for this purpose, which became known as the Encumbered Estates Court, uh, later the Landed Estates Court and, and so on. Uh, I won't go on too much with the history lesson. Uh, the collection that I'm referring to, um, and I'll come to how, we, uh, how it was put together in a moment, um, the forerunner of daft.ie, as I said. Uh, <laughs> at the time that uh, the estates court was in operation, of course, people had to know what was for sale in the court and, and where it was and so on. So these kind of notices were produced. Um, they're large A3 size uh, pa pages, really, or, or sometimes they can be up to 60 pages in length, depending on the size of the estate that was for sale. But basically, it was telling, excuse me, telling you um, whose estate was for sale, who was asking for it to be sold, which is obviously very interesting information, very often the person to whom the money was owed, uh, where it was located, the extent of it, and when and where the sale was likely to happen. So that's what uh, one of the sale notices looks like. Uh, our collection, which is really the, the point of this presentation, um, it's known to us as the, the Dunboyne collection because it was assembled by uh, one of the Butler family, the 14th Baron Dunboyne, and as the title might suggest, they had land in County Mead, but they also had a house uh, beside Napo Castle in County Clare, which you see there in the picture, and uh, it was there that he was living when he assembled this collection. And uh, the collection relates primarily to County Clare, but also to the surrounding counties. He, he was obviously an inveterate collector, this man, because he collected something like, uh, I think it's 42 scrapbooks of news cuttings um, relating to County Clare over his lifetime as well. And they are now in the National Library. Um, I'm not sure whether there was actually a sale of his library perhaps after uh, his death or whatever, but though that particular collection is in the National Library and our collection is, is with us. Um, there, what we have are 29, as I said, A4 bound volumes with this type of material. So this is why I'm, I'm taking you maybe two or three steps back from what uh, Audrey and Orna were talking about. Uh, you know, this is the raw material, if you like, or the sort of raw material. So you, you can see this, they're very attractive uh, items, obviously, as well. This is a map of a townland in County Limerick. The, the River Shannon is up at the top left-hand corner there, um, and divided up by the, the properties, the people who were living in the townland at the time. So there's a, a key, if you like, to, to, the, to that actual map there. Um, it provides us as well, and this is probably where the research part comes in, it, it, it's got lots of social history, very important social history data. Uh, for example, very often it lists the names of the people who are living on the estate, and the most important information relating, apart from their names obviously, is whether or not they had a lease, because if they had a lease, the landlord couldn't evict them uh, at his whim, and uh, furthermore, it often gives you more information about them. So this particular one here, it might be difficult for you to read at the back, but it indicates that the lease dated from the 1830s, and uh, it was for a period of 31 years, or the life of Patrick Skehan Jr., now in Australia. Now, the, the uh, estate was sold in 1852, so immediately somebody who would be doing research on that family would know that he was in Australia in 1852. It also tells you the rent they were paying it tells you things like the fact that they were obliged to pay the tithe, 
the tithe was a property tax. <laughs> there was property tax in the, at the time as well. Um, and furthermore, that the, the uh, person who had the lease had to, to deliver four rails of turf half yearly to the lessor. I, I am not from County Limerick, so I don't know what a rail of turf is. I have to find that out. Um, and furthermore, he couldn't sublet. And as you know, or probably know, that subletting was one of the major issues in Ireland before the famine, where there were so many people um, had been sublet uh, holdings which weren't viable. So there's a lot of social history contained in a very short paragraph in that document. It also tells you things like, um, this is, will be very much for the economic historians, the size of holdings and the amount of rent that they were paying. And there are people in uh, the University of Coventry at the moment doing work on this type of thing. Uh, on, on the, they're trying to create a rent index. So this sort of raw material would be very important for them. So why are they a unique collection? Well, uh, they're, a, they're a unique collection in the sense that it is still uh, available to researchers as a printed collection. Uh, very much access to the, the sale notices are available in the National Archives and the National Library and various other places, but generally now the access is either via uh, microfilm collections or there is a, a, a digital collection of these as well, which I'll mention again later on. But um, they have some unique attributes. You can see there, there are very fine examples of 19th century printing um, and publishing. They're representative of a gentleman's library from the 19th century and the type of thing that he was collecting and you have to look into why was he collecting it uh, and furthermore he annotated them extensively so he very often tells us who sold who bought the estate that was being sold uh, what price it sold for and things like that which again of course is is gold dust to to researchers um, there are, as I said, 29 volumes. They cover uh, the sales of estates in County Clare, but in fact there are lots of other counties <coughs> represented because landowners, of course, weren't confined to one county, so they may have sold estates in a number of counties. Uh, the volumes are indexed uh, in a number of ways. Many years ago we created a very basic printed index, but uh, recently I was involved in a research project at NUI Galway, uh, the, the upshot of which is a website called landedestates.ie. It's a bibliographic research project and the sale notices are indexed on that as well. So if one of those estates was sold, uh, somebody researching that estate will know that they can come to us and, and look at the actual notice. Um, and we've collaborated to some extent with our colleagues in the local study service in Clare County Library who would have a lot of other material relating to these estates. So you know, we can point people in their direction and vice versa. Uh, which, you know, makes, I think the point was made this morning that, of course, academic libraries aren't the only repositories where this type of material is available. Um, I'll come back again to the digital aspect. The, the sale notices, there is a collection of these notices in the National Archives, and uh, about, um, I think, maybe 15 years ago, they were microfilmed initially and subsequently digitised from the microfilm. Um, and they're now available on the uh, genealogy website findmypast.ie along with a lot of other very important Irish material. And they're, it's, it's very good, you know, if you have an inquiry from somebody in Australia, you can direct them to find my past to look at this. But there is not a great comparison really between using them on find my past and using the original notices. Um, and that, of course, creates other uh, implications for us with things like preservation and stuff like that. So to find out more, uh, you can contact myself. You can also look at the Landed Estates um, uh, project, the, the website of the Landed Estates project, which will, it's a bibliographic project, so it directs you to other sources for those uh, estates. But if the estate was sold in the Covered Estates Court, it will be mentioned there. Um, and the bad news is I don't actually have the handout, but uh, anyone who wants a, a listing of sources relating to Irish Landed Estates is very welcome to email me and I'll uh, talk to them again. Thank you very much.